Welcome to the Fix Your Gut Podcast. My name is Jason Hooper, and as always, we're here with John Brissom. Hope y'all are doing well. And today we're going to be talking about prebiotics, so not to be confused with probiotics, which are um, usually living organisms, but sometimes the probiotics you buy in the store are not living. Um, we're talking about prebiotics or what the microorganisms in your gut eat. Um, there are prebiotic supplement products. There are prebiotics in your food and some of your drinks. Um, there's a lot of prebiotics in, um, in human breast milk, um, not quite as much in other animals. Um, but most of these uh, prebiotics are some form, well, I mean, I guess what I would consider to be a prebiotic is some form of ogliosaccharide. And if you know anything about FODMAPs, the O in FODMAP is ogliosaccharide. And um, it was once thought that uh, if you have SIBO or some sort of dysbiosis, it might be a good idea to avoid ogliosaccharides. But in the past five years or so, we've kind of changed our minds on that. And we've seen a lot of people who benefit greatly from uh, ogliosaccharides uh, certain types of ogliosaccharides, of course. Um, some are better than others, and we'll talk about uh, some different ogliosaccharides. And there's uh, some, there are some things that are not oligosaccharides that also feed the gut, like collagen, for example, bifidobacteria, sure. you know, like collagen uh, ingestion, and upper gut bacteria, which you know could be good or bad depending on whether you know what the flora you have in your upper gut. They like amino acid supplementation and. And mm -hmm. glucose in itself can technically be a prebiotic, right? And that it does feed certain bacteria and, and also um, uh, lactulose, which, you know, we'll talk about lactulose too as well a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, a good place to start would be with collagen then since it's one of the sort of outlying um, non-sugar-based um, prebiotics. Um, collagen is uh, a protein that usually comes from the soft tissues of, of animals. Um, there's, there's different forms of it. Uh, collagen is not a complete protein, so it's, it's missing uh, tryptophan. Um, so, um, it's, it's not a, it doesn't have all of the amino acids. It's very unusual in that regard. And you can get it in different forms, like from cartilage tissue. You can get it from um, like the – sometimes they use uh, fish bones to make uh, collagen protein. Um, some, uh, a lot of times, like the commercial collagen powders that you see um, on the market are made from the hides of animal skin. Sometimes like, they're made from chicken too as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, – I think for chicken, they get it from their, 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 uh, feet, right? Yeah. They can get it from the feet, the beaks. Um, there's a lot of different ways they can, uh, they can get it out. So yeah, I mean, it's. And collagen is high in, high in glycine, isn't it? The amino acid glycine. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, it is, but something about that protein specifically, uh, seems to really, um, set some bacteria off um, and and make them really start to thrive. And that's not always a good thing. Yeah, like if you had H. pylori, you probably wouldn't want to be pounding the singular amino acids and eating a lot of collagen. Because when you have, you know, bacteria, they like to, you know, most people think of bacteria, they, they think they, they ferment carbohydrates, but they can break down and ferment and process protein too. So there are people with certain dysbiosis that can get bloating and digestive discomfort from eating a lot of protein. Isn't that right, Jason? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just be careful if you're, if you're eating a lot of collagen uh, protein or something with protein powder, just, you know, watch for bloating afterwards. If you start bloating or if you get some silent reflux or something along those lines, it's probably a good idea to uh, stay away from that. Or if you had uh, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, you probably will want to avoid bovine sourced collagen. Yeah. Um, and stick with uh, fish-based collagen or, or, or um, uh, chicken-based. 
uh, poultry based, but it does, you know, collagen does have benefits. You know, it does help a lot of people with joint issues and uh, exercise recovery. And it does feed uh, the probiotic bac bacteria, bifidobacterium, uh, which we have that uh, through a lot of research done by Russians, Russian studies uh, that show that it does increase uh, bifidobacteria colonies um, in the body. But like everything, you know, all of the, uh, all of the uh, prebiotics that we talk today, they all have their uses, they all have their positives, and they all have their negatives. Yeah, for sure. Um, some just have more positive than benefits. I mean, they're not all equal. Oh, um, no, no, not at all, no. Yeah. Um, but collagen is mm. one that I recommend, and I'll put a link uh, in the show notes with the blog that I had written. But again, you know, it does have some drawbacks and things that you want to look out for its supplementation as well. Yeah. Okay. So let's get into, um, well, I mean, I guess a lot of amino acids could be considered to be, uh, prebiotics as well. Um, like, uh, for instance, L-glutamine, uh, is very prebiotic. So I think, um, like we, we hear back from a lot of people who have had, um, H. pylori overgrowth, and they're also supplementing with L-glutamine, um, which, it, you know, it could be used in a protocol for to help uh, rebuild the mucosal lining of the of the intestines. In the stomach. Uh, yeah, but if you've got H. pylori overgrowth, and even if you don't have H. pylori gro overgrowth, doing that protocol can increase the number of H. pylori and decrease the number of lactobacillus in the stomach, which can make problems. Yeah. So definitely if you are dealing with some sort of, you know, upper gut dysbiosis, whether it's H. pylori or Citrobacter or Protobaris, Protospera bolus or Klebsiella, you know, bacteria that live in that general area, uh, you definitely want to limit, um, you definitely want to limit your amino acid ingestion, whether it is isolated amino acids like L-glutamine supplementation or ingesting, you know, uh, more, uh, complex protein like collagen um, or whey protein or any of the protein powders themselves. Many people with upper gut disorder tend to have a lot of issues with those um, with, with those uh, protein type based uh, sup supplements um, and even eating a lot of meat too. They can't have issues with it as well. Uh, so, you know, you have to listen to your body. If it makes you feel bad and you bloat, then you, you cut back on it and, and change your microbiome in the hope that you are able to tolerate it more positively in the future. Yeah, for sure. Um, so there, um, it, there are probiotic fats as well, like butyric acid, um, for instance, can be probiotic. Um, acetic acid. Yeah, acetic acid. Uh, so you can you can have some uh, prebiotic effects from uh, from some, you know fatty acids, particularly the shorter chain fatty acids. Uh, but they don't have as much of a pronounced effect as some of the proteins and amino acids. Yeah. Um, and they also, you know, supplementation, like we talk about butyric acid, it seems to not work as well than the butyric acid that your own probiotic bacteria produce within the digestive system itself as far as reducing inflammation and improving digestion. You know, I've had some people supplement with butyric acid. And it works very well. And other people supplement that it doesn't work very well. So especially if someone has a lot of inflammation going on, like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, and they're in a flare up, you, you generally do not want to give them butyric acid. Instead, you want to kind of change the microbiome with some of the prebiotics that we're going to about to talk about in a more positive light and reduce the mycobacteria, maybe impaired tuberculosis so that your body can produce its own butyrate and then butyrate actually starts being more beneficial. Yeah, that's right. Um, so the, the, I guess the most pronounced prebiotics that we, we talk about and that we know about right now are they're carbohydrate based uh, and they're specific carbohydrates called oligosaccharides which are these complex sugars um, and they're they're in a lot of the foods we eat they're in uh, they're in pretty large quantities in in human milk um, and so we have this whole category of 
oligosaccharides called human milk oligosaccharides or HMOs for short. Um, and not to be confused with the HMO on your medical insurance. These are a different type of HMO. Um, but yeah, there's um, primarily in, in, in breast milk, um, we see most of the, um, you, you would think since it's milk, you would, you would think that, and, and uh, human breast milk has a lot of lactose in it. So you would think that most of the oligosaccharides that are in there are lactose based, but they're actually, most of them, like a good, a good chunk of them are um, fructose based. And it depends on the mother, but probably as much as 80, 80 to 90% of the total um, HMOs in breast milk are composed of of uh, fructose as the sugar bait, as the uh, as the uh, sh sugar nucleotide that connects to the um, to the oligosaccharide. So there are all kinds of um, of these sugars of these HMOs. I mean, there's like we're still I'm saying we, but like uh, people that are researching this are they're still identifying new sugars and they're still identifying new genes. Um, that produce enzymes that can make new sugars all the time, uh, and it's it's kind of an interesting uh, interesting thing. Some of them actually are not prebiotic, but they're they act as um, anti adhesive antimicrobials, and they help reduce um, H pylori in the gut uh, because when they they bind to the uh, mannose connecting glycans for H. pylori, it just kills them, uh, which is kind of cool, I think. Um, so uh, some of these, HM, not all of the HMOs are prebiotic. Some of them are actually antimicrobial in nature. Um, so I guess the most common um, prebiotic that we're going to likely see on the market is fructooglyosaccharide, or FOS for short. And if you're buying a supplement or if you're getting it from food, that's the most common one in nature. And it's the most common one that you're going to see on the supplement market. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, with FOS or fruit oligosaccharides, um, you know, they're found in very like inulin rich foods like chicory and onion, banana, garlic, asparagus, uh, wheat, uh, tomatoes and the Jerusalem artichoke. So mm -hmm. the FOS, it tends to be, it's one of the most problematic prebiotics. Would you agree, Jason? I think that it's one of the ones that may do more harm than good in some people. Yes. Um, not that it's saying that its ingestion isn't important and for a healthy microbiome. It is, but you don't want to overdo it because it can produce a lot of gas or, or, or bloating. Um, but yeah, I mean, I recommend most people and I, you probably would too, to get most of their FOS is from foods instead of taking an isolated FOS supplement. Yeah, I, I, I would tend to agree. Now it's like, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't like stop eating, um, certain foods because they have S FOS, but, um, you know, like if, if you're having these overgrowth issues, it might be something that you w look to avoid in your diet, um, or you know, start supplementing with a different prebiotic to help balance everything out. Yeah, because you know, there's a, a study that just came out recently, or they keep saying, well, gluten insensitivity is about the fruit tan. It's not about the 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 the, uh, the gluten in, uh, itself. And though there may be some truth to that, and I'm going to write about this very soon. Uh, because you know FOS is 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 uh, is is a is a fructan, um, so though they may cause bloating and digestive discomfort and stuff like that, it's more than just if people have gluten insensitivity, uh, then that's not celiac disease. It's more than just the fructans themselves that can cause issues. You know, it could be the gluten itself. It could be the combination of gluten and fructans. It could be the combination of gluten, fructans, iron fortification, and wheat and glyphosate. Uh, pesticide usage. There's many different functions of why a person may not be able to tolerate a gluten, but can tolerate, for example, uh, uh, onions that would have, or uh, asparagus that would have a lot of fructans in them. And some people who are SIBO, you know, they can't tolerate any fructans. It just depends on the person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
and the type of person, the type of fructin that um, that, that typically uh, is interacting with whatever's giving them trouble. The other things that are in the, the foods that they're eating, you know, onions, it might not be the fructans. It may be the sulfur. Could be. Yeah, absolutely. It could be the sulfur compounds. It could be um, a lot of different things uh, for onions for sure. But, you know, if you're eating Jerusalem artichokes, well, the culprit's probably the the fructooglyosaccharide, the FOS. Yeah, it's just, you know, what we're, I guess the main thing we're trying to talk about today is, is you're supposed to try the prebiotics that have less harm. And though fructan ingestion and FOS ingestion, inulin ingestion has helped a lot of people with digestive issues, it's also caused a lot of people with digestive issues, issues discomfort too as well. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I don't know. I would be really wary about supplementing with it. I wouldn't say you'd necessarily need to strike it from your diet entirely, depend unless you're in a severe condition. But it's definitely not my favorite of the commercial prebiotic products. And it's the uh, most accessible and the cheapest too. It's dirt cheap. And that's why it's the most accessible. Yeah. Well, it's really easy to make because you can. I mean, they. I mean, they either they say like, well, oh, we're extracting it from chicory or you know artichoke or whatever maybe some of them are but it's also really easy to manufacture with yeast because the fut gene um, is really easy to splice into a yeast cell and just they just feed them sugar and they crank out fos so um it's, yeah they it's sure really make a lot of it don't they yeah well i mean if you if you program them too they do so uh that's that's something that uh they can do uh for sure <clears throat> So, yeah, the other commercial product that we see that's uh, the second most common is, is GOS. And this has a different uh, sugar nucleotide to the oligosaccharide. Um, and it uses uh, galacto, uh, galactose instead of um, fructose. So um, it's or, or galatose. Uh, is I guess part is it's it's a simple sugar sort of yes, like it is, it's a monosaccharide sugar just like uh, glucose right so if you take glucose and combine it with with gal uh, sorry galactose and glucose and you combine those together you get lactose um, so uh, it's it's a it's a simple sugar it's a monosaccharide like uh, table sugar would be a disaccharide because you know there's there's two glucose fructose um, and glucose right yeah fructose and yeah yeah um, same with with a lot of other sweeteners so um, in any case uh, GOS um, is found in mushrooms um, quite a bit um, and so animal dairy uh, that contains um, uh, sugar so milk cream right yeah in fact in in ruminant animals like in, in humans and in, in the human breast milk the fructose derived um prebiotics are more common but in ruminant animals the galatose based are much much more common and in shorter number and um, I'm, I'm kind of theorizing that the reason why that is is because they they have multiple stomachs, right? So, or the majority of them have multiple stomachs. So it's like a cow um, has four stomachs, right? Yes. Yeah, so you, you don't necessarily um, like their digestion is is working differently than humans. So they probably need uh, different sorts of prebiotics to make everything work. Um, and if they get too much gas in their stomachs, then they could have serious problems, even die. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, but they, it's, they produce a lot of methane, you know, sometimes farmers have to go in and puncture their stomachs to let the gas out. Yeah. It's crazy. And they, <laughs> yeah. And they usually don't live after that. I mean, it's, no. that, that's like a last ditch thing. But yeah, I mean, it's, that's not a good deal. Like if they get like, if they get into like a patch of clover after a frost or something like that, it's just, I'm not sure, like some sort of oligosaccharide occurs um, after the freeze, like the plant starts to conserve its 
energy by converting the carbohydrates over. And then you know, the cows eat it. And, and the hydrogen uh, bacterial dysbiosis goes crazy. And then their methane dominant archaea produce a crap ton of methane. And they can't handle the methane. So they bloat horribly to the point where the cow's on the ground dying from bloating. Yeah. Yeah. And they usually don't live after that, unfortunately. There's not yeah. a lot you can do. So, yeah. So GOS, we see it a lot in mushrooms. We see, we see it a lot in, in animal and uh, ruminant animal milk. Um, and I think it's a much better prebiotic than than FOS. Yeah, a lot of your probiotic bacteria uh, seem to like it, like bifidobacteria, lactobacilli, and a lot of your firmicutes like rosaberia, um, and a lot of your opportunistic bacteria like E. coli, uh, Provotella, Salmonella, uh, and Clostridia, which are some form of probiotic clostridia, like a clostridia uh, bitrachinum, uh, but clostridium difficile uh, seem to not like a galactoagosaccharides very much. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of uh, different uh, bacterioids that, uh, that feed off of it too. Um, like the old, the one that we used to call uh, Infantis, um, that we call it like planetarium now. Um, the, oh, lacto, you talk about lactobacillus plantarum? Right, right. And the, uh, yeah. Um, and the uh, Theramordial micron uh, based bacteria will have, will tend to be able to um, metabolize GOS a lot more uh, because they contain the LN or the, the LN, lowercase n, T gene for, for being able to break down that carbohydrate. Yeah, I mean, galactosaccharide ingestion seems to also increase secretory IgA levels in people with very low secretory IgA. And of course, secretory IgA is a class of antibodies that's produced by the mucosal surface of your intestinal tract. Um, and it's kind of like a way of activating the immune system against endotoxins and pathogenic organisms and stuff like that. So people with very low secretory IgA levels and like Genova tests and everything, it tends to be, they tend to suffer from severe leaky gut because the immune system is not being activated properly and the gut junctions tend to be more wide open. Uh, so you do want everything, we react to everything that we eat, that we ingest. You just want a good, healthy, moderate reaction. You know, you don't want a very underreaction where the immune system does nothing at all or overreaction where you have severe inflammation and bleeding and so forth and so on from that. And people with, uh, see, my, my theory on that is that people with thin and gut linings and people that um, have a lot of biofilms and not a lot of mucosal membranes, they secrete less uh, inflammatory markers uh, for anything because there's less material there to secrete those. Yes. And so, you know, the, the solution to that you know, probiotics, prebiotics work well for that, but just anything you can do to, um, to increase that mucosal membrane so that you, you know, you can secrete more. I think that's really important. Yeah. I mean, and within reason, you don't want it to be too high either when you have extremely amounts of, you know, extreme amounts of inflammation. Uh, but yes, I do. I did. GOS was my pr premier prebiotic that I recommended. Um, before uh, 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 the more human milk oligosaccharides actually started being sold on the market, uh, just because people seem to do better on it, the opportunistic bacteria were able to use it less, the probiotic bacteria were able to be use it more. So it worked very well, you know, stimulate the immune system. Uh, you know, and there's studies of it, you know, reducing allergy sensitivity and severity and improving calcium and magnesium absorption. That might just be from improving the microbiome. Um, but yeah, you know, and so there are a few other prebiotics I want to briefly just talk about that are oligosaccharides that really aren't, um, you know, used very much or really known about. And that is isomalt oligosaccharide and mannan oligosaccharides, uh, mm -hmm. which isomalt oligosaccharide, that comes from um, uh, uh, isomaltose. Um, and it's uh, usually start, s produced through starch hydrolysis. Sometimes they make it from wheat. Sometimes they make it from... Uh, uh, corn, uh, but it seems to, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, studies with it of not producing so much gas because, you know, anulin produces a lot of gas for most people. GOS really doesn't in most cases. Isomalt doesn't either. And it also helps increase bifidobacterium properties. But again, I can't really 
recommended because there's not a lot of studies and some of the source material that they use is wheat. So some people who are very, 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 very sensitive to wheat may react negatively to isomod oligosaccharides. And a man in oligosaccharides comes from uh, glucomannan protein complexes that are usually uh, sourced from fungi um, and, and yeast uh, too as well, like a uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, so MOS is, uh, it's got some good studies behind it too. It inhibits, uh, E. coli, opportunistic E. coli and opportunistic salmonella. Um, it may reduce opportunistic clostridium, like, uh, clostridium, uh, perf- which is known to cause a foodborne illness. Um, and it has been shown also to, to increase, uh, intestinal villi and stimulate a uh, secretory IgA levels like a uh, GOS does. And also uh, helps increase bifidobacterium and lactobacillus. But again, there's just not a lot of studies with uh, mano oligosaccharides yet. And some people who have yeast issues can have issues with MOS because it's derived from yeast. So anybody's yeast sensitivity they may act negatively to uh, mano and oligosaccharides. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I do recommend Jaro's formula with Saccharomyces boulardii that has man and oligosaccharides for anybody with clostridium, clostridium difficile uh, dysbiosis. It seems to work very well for that. Yeah. Antamoeba, histolysia also um, will be reduced. You know, it's, and that's just basically because of the mannitol yep. uh, nucleotide. So, you know, I don't. For and me, also, though, it also helps with E. coli UTIs too because of the man. And uh, I wanted to mention that too as well, Jason. I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you. I'm sorry. I, no, it's all right. It's just for me, I just don't see that much of a increase in benefit from using that over just straight mannitol or it might be better for most people just to ingest cranberry juice um yeah i mean that that has a lot of mannitol in it you know and it's it's the concentration isn't as uh, high right yeah i mean yeah i usually rarely i only usually recommend d manos use in people who specifically know that their urinary tract infection is e coli based because it works very very well for that yeah, yeah. Um, but those are the other oligosaccharides too that I wanted to mention that are out there that are lesser than GOS or lesser than um, FOS. Now, have uh, one last thing I want to mention too before you get to the the the, the human based ones is arabinogalactan, uh, which is large fiber, which many people um, use or you could do well well with that with a prebiotic. Um, now, rabbit and galactans are normally found in foods like ca- carrots, radishes, pears, corn, tomatoes, coconut milk, and uh, meat. It's also found in the herbs, echinacea, curcumin, and mistletoe. Um, and uh, most people that I recommend the use of rabbit and galactans for are fit into two categories. Uh, one, people with allergies, because it seems to reduce TH2 dominance very well. Uh, and second, people who are, have severe lactose intolerance, whether genetically or microbiome-based, that cannot tolerate uh, a lot of the uh, 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 lactose-based oligosaccharide prebiotics. Um, how, what do you feel about arabinoglactan or large tree fiber, uh, Jason? I haven't read too many studies on them, um, so I don't really – and I don't have any data on that, so I don't know. That's kind of a new one for me. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to work very well for people with um, ammonia uh, dysbiosis. It seems to help uh, reduce that. Increases bifido and lactobacillus seems to work against opportunistic clostridia and E. coli. Uh, there are some cautions uh, with it that uh, it possibly could make Klebsiella maybe worse, like a GOS possibly, um, as well as um, one of my main warning for it is, is arabinoglactans are a component of mycobacterium cell walls. So anybody with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or anybody suffering from a mycobacterium infection uh, like tuberculosis, you would not want to ingest arabinoglactans at all, period, uh, because of that, because it could just provoke a very strong immune reaction. Um, but, you know, I have coached quite a few people who have used arabinoglactans and have worked very well for them. All right. Um, the next commercial product um, that's available there's and is the uh, is 2FL, um, which is kind of hard to find. I mean, you can find some products with it. The easiest way to find 2FL is in infant formula. Well, now you can know in America, you can in Europe, you can finally get hold of Glycom. It's not that hard. You can buy it off of Amazon. Yeah. Now, that was only for the past last year, 2018. Before then, it was almost you were you're exactly right. The only way you could get it was in baby formula. But now, if you live in the United States, 
and, or you live in Europe, you know, Europe, you can get glycom sent to you as part of a trial. Um, in the United States, you have to buy it off of Amazon, the, the Holigo supplement uh, for 2FL. But yeah, you can get hold of it now. Uh, it only in the past last year or so it has, you know, you couldn't use it since then. Yeah. Um, so with, with 2FL, 2FL is an interesting prebiotic. Um, it, it has, it also has some antimicrobial properties. It's been shown to bind to staphylococcus. Um, and, uh, scientists think the reason for that might be to prevent infections in the mammonary glands. Um, so to help keep staff from getting in there and, and messing stuff up. Um, so I think that's, uh, that it's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah. There's many different bacteria was showed to inhibit like, uh, hemophilus influenzae, pseudomonas aerogosa, uh, vibro cholerae, the cause of cholerae, uh, MAP, uh, Campylobacter, E. coli and uh, streptococcus pneumoniae. Um, so it, it, it does work very well. I mean, it makes sense if it's highly concentrated in the breast milk. Uh, uh, wouldn't that be seem like it would, you know, to feed the infant's gut? Wouldn't it seem like that would be one of the, the you know, best ways to keep them healthy is to modify the microbiome in a more positive light, right? Well, yeah. And some people will say that infants are born with almost no microbiome. They're born nearly sterile. And, uh, so, uh, they, yeah, I don't believe of, that. I think that's pretty much outdated by now. They get their microbiome out in their mother's womb. And when they go through the vaginal tract, right? Yeah. Some of it for sure. But they're, they're really developing their immune system from the, uh, from the sugars that are in the breast milk. And yes, that's I agree with that. It's shape. It makes sure that the microbiome is shaped. It's part of the package. Right. Right. But, uh, F2L had, you know, it's, um, you know, it has the fructose nucleotide, but it also has the sialic acid uh, component to it as well. Um, so it, it really does have an influence on the microbiome. It, um, you know, like some stuff, it's like, all right, well, bacteria like to eat this and certain bacteria like to eat this more. And so they grow with this certain bacteria like to eat it and others it kills. So. As and some product. like H. pylori might possibly be able to use it maybe yeah. for adherence properties. Now, we know that H. pylori is able to use blood antigen uh, expressions for, for, for to bind, um, but we're not sure. And, we, and through studies, we know that one of the main ways that they make 2-FL commercially is, in, 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 is, is putting in um, H. pylori genes into recombinant E. coli to produce it. Right. Um, and I, I believe that H. Pyl I th I, if you have H. pylori overgrowth, you should stay away from, from 2-FL um, for sure and maybe switch to something like 3-FL. Um, which they, which actually they are starting. Hopefully, um, Glycom will offer that. They actually offer a two FL, three uh, FL blend. Yeah, yeah, they do. Just getting the pure three FL is probably what you'd want to go with um, in that case. Uh, but um, yeah, that's those are the common commercial fructoglyosaccharides. For others, you're just probably going to have to go to a lab for unless you're going to drink human breast milk. Um, and uh, that's kind of a precious resource because, you know, it's for, for babies, you know. So if you went to like a, uh, what do you call those, those milk banks or whatever, um, where pe mothers are having trouble lactating or the infants having trouble latching and some moms donate extra breast milk, I don't think you could just go down to one of those shops and be like, hey, could I have some because I'm, uh, I'm trying to uh, improve my gut. Like I don't think they're going. No, do actually, I was wrong. It doesn't have three FL. It has uh, lacto lacto in tetrios LNT. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. I the, that. I got that confused. It uses LNT and two FL, not two okay. FL and three FL. My bad. That I'm that makes that. that makes more sense because uh, the other like the other one um, after we were done talking about the uh, fructose based oligosaccharides would be the lactose based, and that's like the major commercial. Um, LNT is. Yeah, yeah. Lacto and tetrios, yeah. 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 Neno tetrios, yeah. Uh, neo, sorry, neo, neo tetralis. Yeah. So, so like the, um, 
Yeah, that that's the other one that's that seems to be uh, pretty commercially available as well, and um, you can find that on the market um, as you know, in, in some uh, you know there there's a company I think in Sweden that produces it. Uh, there are some labs in Europe that produce it and ship it over, and they're used in um, in some. Uh, and for formulas, they'll use 2FL, right. 3FL, and LNT. Correct. Yeah, yeah. But outside of the in, uh, infant formula, people who are, you know, they're looking for IBS remedies and whatnot, like they'll they'll have these packets of, of you know, sugars and you just add them to water and drink it. Um, I mean, I guess you don't have to do it that way, but that's probably the easiest way to get it down. I guess you could just take it straight. <laughs> but uh, yeah yeah i mean do you think uh, i guess one thing okay so the, the the main i guess the main prebiotics that you and i would recommend or at least i would recommend and you can give off yours is mine would be 2fl for most people and uh, you know glycoms holigos 2fl for most people unless they have h pluri dysbiosis and glycosaccharides for most people unless they have klebsiella or they can't digest lactose, or arabinogalactan, as long as a person doesn't have mycobacterium avian paratuberculosis, which is a cause of Crohn's disease ulcerative colitis, or they suffer from severe Th1 dominance, um, then I would not touch arabinogalactans. But those are the three prebiotics that I would recommend. Um, I, I would substitute that last one for LNT. Okay. Um, that that would that would be my recommendation, just because we know more about it, and we we do know that it is a uh, uh, it is from human uh, breast milk. You know, it is an HMO, so um, there's there's you know we've been getting that as infants for thousands of years. So um, there's there's a lot of you know it's probably tried and true. So although so we don't don't have as many. Yeah, like the study comparison, you know, isn't going to be there, but naturally speaking, humans yeah, you're are right. get in that. So yeah, you, you're uh, definitely right. What about what about uh, sugar alcohols? Like, wouldn't they also have a prebiotic effect too, to some yeah, degree? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, xylitol, mannitol, erythritol. Um, out of all the sugar alcohols, which one do you generally recommend? I know most people recommend erythritol. Um, Just as, as a sweetener. Yes. And it would feed the gut and it would feed the gut too, you know? Okay. So some of the issues with the, I mean, you have to understand that when you're playing around with these compounds that, um, that it's, it can be really dangerous because one of the worst toxins that we can be exposed to is lipoogliosaccharides. That's when you take one of these oogliosaccharides and you connect it to a fat. And that's, that's bad because it gets stuck in our in our fat transport systems um, and our high density and low density packets that are transporting fat around the body, and then those packets kind of just get deposited somewhere in the body. And usually, since you know the heart is the center of our circulatory system, a lot of times it gets deposited there, and it ends up as arterial plaque. Um, and sometimes it gets deposited in the brain and you don't want them in either of those places. Uh, if you're especially sedentary, you might get it in your, you know, thigh tissues or, or something, but usually it ends up in your heart. So when you're playing around with these things, you got to make sure that it's not being converted into, into endotoxin. Um, and, and the, the issue with a lot of these, um, these commercial uh, sweeteners is that that's exactly what they do. Now with mannitol, um, there's not a lot of evidence for that, but xylitol definitely is is going to be an issue. Um, erythritol could be an issue, and not not only it, the, the formation of these endotoxins an issue, but you know it, what's the first thing that happens if you eat too much um, sh- if you eat too much sugar alcohol. Well, you get massive diarrhea, right? So when you yes, it's that's the osmotic body. laxative, like lactulose, any any of them, right? So um, and you know sometimes they they use mannitol as a laxative, um, and and so not only are you getting uh, not not only are you getting exposure to endotoxin, but also um, that osmotic effect that comes in. the The reason why the water comes in is because the tight junctions open up. So when they're open, the endotoxins can come 
into the bloodstream and you don't want them in there. So that's the double whammy. You have the creation of the endotoxins from those compounds and you have a way for them to get in. So I would use sugar alcohols very sparingly. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, lactulose, even though it's not a sugar alcohol, like I mentioned earlier, it can cause diarrhea uh, too as well. Many people who use lactulose t- as, a, as, a, as, a, as a medication to either treat co- constipation or reduce ammonia, which, by the way, um, uh, arabinic lactans do better than that. I recommend that over lactulose any day. Um, they, they can cause diarrhea too. So, yeah, I mean, I only use xylitol and a little bit in chewing gum. Uh, which you'd be okay with that, right? Did a little bit in chewing gum and a little bit in, in, in dental care products, right? I mean, that should be negligible in the amount that you're taking in, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, they're like really small amounts. It's been shown to, um, it's been shown to improve uh, dental health. Um, but yeah, they have that like, uh, what's that gum call? I have some right here in my desk, actually. I mean, I use, I use, um, uh, I use xylitol gum. I can't. I use. I don't use. I use a different one. But it has like one gram of xylitol. Per two pieces or whatever, one milligram. Um, yeah, this one has one gram, uh, one gram should point, I say? 0.72 grams per piece. So, yeah. It's I mean, it's not too that, much, you know, and you're not in eating it. You are swallowing some of it from your saliva, obviously, but. Yeah, you're um, definitely. But when you brush your teeth, you know, you can spit it out. Um, yeah, it has shown to have some dental benefits. Um, but, uh, you know. I would, and of I course, would. I of course I have my issues with Zorbitol too, because that's the one of the main ones that are used for diabetic candy, um, and a lot. Yeah. And some uh, diabetic medications can inhibit the aldose reductase pathway and right. cause Zorbitol to accumulate in the eyes and cause permanent eye damage. So if you're diabetic, I would definitely not ingest Zorbitol, especially you know if you're taking any aldo- aldose reductase pathway medication. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I would. I would stay away with sorbitol as much as possible. Yeah, I would. I mean, I don't think it. I mean, a little bit that you get in. Uh, it's in prune juice, isn't it? Yes. A little bit you would get in prune juice is fine, but I mean, I would not. You know, if you're taking any type of aldose reductase uh, uh, medication for 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 diabetes, and wouldn't I wouldn't touch it. So. Yeah. Um... I don't know. As far as sweeteners go, um, stevia is kind of on the fence um, for for a sweetener. There's some studies that show that it might have uh, some uh, it might it might have some endocrine suppression. So we don't know. Yeah, but they go back and forth of that, and, and stevia has been used in certain. Uh, you know, so South American societies forever you know so i'd actually argue that it's it, i would say it's safer than sugar alcohols just based off of that component because even though sugar alcohols are in some of the foods we eat like plums for example um there's a big difference between eating it in a plum or in concentrated prune juice like for sorbitol than it is taking massive amounts of supplemental sorbitol or adding it to candies and foods right yeah because you're getting other compounds with it and uh, and that uh you know, that helps for sure. Eating a plum versus a dried prune is going to have more. And then the prune juice, which is going to have even more. So, yeah, I mean, it's like... But there's actually polyphenols in the fruit and everything and and nutrients and stuff. We're isolated. That's added to diabetic candy. That's Sure. Silly. Well, and fiber and other sugars. Yeah. You know? But, you know, the, the diabetics that are really severe probably aren't going to be eating plums. Um, or prunes for that matter. but Yeah, but they'll eat the diabetic yeah. rhesus. And then if they're having an aldose reductase pathway medication, they'll go blind. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, there are some other um, quote-unquote natural sweeteners that are coming out too. Um, and monk kind fruit? Of, yeah, monk fruit. And that one to me I think is probably pretty prebiotic. So I think you should be careful with that one. Um just especially if you have any dysbiosis or overgrowth, I would be I would be really careful with monk fruit, fruit, but still probably superior to, you know, your your erythritols and definitely xylitol. So I guess as far as the best sugar alcohol is probably erythritol more than likely. Yeah, I think it. Well, geez, I think yeah, it's probably the safest erythritol is. 
But if you're going to use, again, I would argue that if you're going to sweeten your stuff, it's probably best. If you're going to have a sweet thing every now and then, it's probably best to use honey and maple syrup and just deal with the sugar than to binge on these other, you know, low carbohydrate sweeteners because they all have their positives and negatives. I guess I would recommend stevia as probably being the safest. I guess. Yeah. I, I mean, probably, probably the safest. Um, it just depends on what your dietary deal is. Like if you're like a, a lot of people are doing the ketogenic thing, you know, and they're, they're not going to want to, well, they need to refeed carbs. every so often unless it's, it's a true, medical, yeah. unless it's a medical di- a ketogenic diet. And of course, right. if it is, it yeah, you have to deal with stevia. I get it, but I mean, you know, most everybody else will refeed. If you have a little bit of honey or a little bit of maple syrup, you right. wouldn't be against that, would you, Jason? No, I mean, and, and and the thing is, like, if you're not doing low carb and you're already eating carbs, you might as well. I, I think that if you're if you're just worried about um, decreasing calorie or your, your total caloric consumption. So you're using an artificial sweetener versus honey. I think it's going to be pretty negligible. And I think the, the risks outweigh the rewards there. So if you're doing it for weight loss, I don't think that's really the way to go. Yeah. And I would say too, that of course, honey and maple syrup do have a lot of fructose in it, but they also do have a lot of minerals in them too. And a lot of properties, you know, honey has a lot of antibacterial properties and hydroglycol and everything like that, hydroxyglycol and stuff. So, you know, even though, you know, we don't want to ingest a lot of fructose because it can't be bad for the liver, you know, within moderation, it can't be beneficial. You know, it all depends on the person and their state of health. Yeah. How much you're consuming versus your body weight and what you're eating it with and all this other stuff. Like if you're just pounding down, um, you know, like agave nectar or whatever, then yeah, well, I would never, might... I would never touch agave nectar. There's not really much benefit to it compared to maple syrup or, or honey. Agave nectar is just so high in fructose. I think it's like 80 to 90%. It's even so... higher than high fructose corn syrup. Yeah. Actually high fructose corn syrup is only half fructose, just like honey. Yeah. Yeah. So I think so it... the high fructose corn syrup actually, I think gets a pretty bad rap. Even though it does have its own negative, like mercury could be left over from processing and different things. I'm not a fan of high fructose corn syrup at all. But that being said, if you're looking at it strictly from a fructose component, agave nectar is far worse. And everybody's like, agave nectar is natural and blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, ugh, no, no. <laughs> you just stick with honey. <laughs> and maple, heck, even even table sugar, you know, uh, even, even straight, you know, <laughs> molasses would have more nutrient component than agave nectar so yeah although not much in any of it hey well there is there is some nutrients in blackstrap molasses now yeah yeah there's there's some like trace minerals and stuff so yeah you you pick up a little bit from the from the vat while while creating it you know you pick up some (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so since we, since, since, since we are on the topic, I know we were, I mean, these are all prebiotics. They all feature gut in one way or another. Um, what about like coconut sugars and stuff like that? How do you feel about that? Uh, that's, that's pretty good marketing, I think. Yeah. With the, the coconut sugar. It's like, oh, we extracted this from coconuts. Well, I don't know if they really did or not, number one. You know, like evaporated cane sugar and evaporated coconut sugar. It's it's like the same thing. It's just regular table sugar. Maybe, uh, I don't know. I think people are just really pulling hairs with that stuff. There's just any way you can make a buck, you know. And and I guess as we are talking about sugar, and it is a prebiotic, um, anybody with upper gut dysbiosis like H. pylori, you should definitely, definitely, definitely reduce your added sugar um, or try to reduce, you know, avoid added added sugar or any t- source of table sugar because the H. pylori or many bacteria that are associated with upper gut dysbiosis will feed off of that um, and will cause digestive issues by increased production of endotoxins. Uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, you need to uh, stay away from from table sugar for sure and a lot of other monosaccharides as well. You shouldn't be pounding the sugar in your coffee in the morning, you know, putting two tablespoons in when you got H. pylori. <laughs> no. And probably shouldn't be drinking coffee either. Just but, you because- know, remember, people, these, you know, prebiotics, depending on where they are. For example, inulin won't really – H. pylori wouldn't really affect inulin, right, Jason? Because it just wouldn't, wouldn't have time to ferment it. 
right? Um, probably not. Yeah. Unless you had severe gastroparesis. Right. Um, so, you know, different bacteria, they ingest and are able to break down and use and utilize different things. Yeah. So if you have colonic overgrowth, you actually might be able to get away with some sugar. If you have H. pleura, on the other hand, it's definitely not a good idea. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people have H. pylori. So switch uh, to honey. <laughs> Is there any other uh, any other uh, prebiotics that we're missing? Anything that we can think of? Or I guess uh, our blood group antigens with the FUT2 gene, I guess the expression of those uh, into our saliva and to our, our mucosal barrier and stuff like that, those would be prebiotics by bacteria too, right? Yeah, for well, for sure. Yeah, I mean, that basically, um, there's a whole series of FUT, FUT genes that secrete, and not just us, but bacteria have them as well. And just remember, these things work both ways. So it's, it can help to create uh, something, and it can also help to break it down. So which way does it go? And, you know, sometimes we're breaking stuff down, and sometimes we're creating stuff. So with the fructoglyosaccharides with the FUT2 gene, um, we can break some of the fructans down that we eat and use them as energy. And uh, we can also use it to help create some stuff. So um, that, but that tends to work more with our immune system. So yeah, where well, I pretty much we expo- with people with FUT2 normal genes that don't have any polymorphisms, uh, they tend to express their blood histo uh, within their mucosal barrier and their tears. Um, and, every, and so that tends to feed the bacteria in our microbiome. Right, right. And also yeah. women with that gene too, without a polymorphism, tend to express more 2FL in their milk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Lots more. Yeah. Where, um, where other women tend to, they would produce more uh, lacto and uh, tetrios, LNT. Yeah. Yeah. And, or, you know, there's a lot of other um, fructose compounds that they, that they would produce instead, but most of them, they're, they're still going to have, they're still going to be producing mostly fructose based um, HMOs, uh, regardless of their secretor status. And, and, you know, the, the fundamental differences between some of these are pretty small. Yeah. They'll produce three FL. Right. And they'll produce L- LNFP3. So, yeah, but it's just, it is interesting about FUT2 about how a lot of people wouldn't think of that, that what makes your blood type O or A or AB, you know, FUT1 expresses that in the blood. FUT2, you actually express those antigens in your mucosal surfaces. Yeah, but they've also found that they're, that th- those are expressed in people of all blood types, just not as much. Yes. Um, not as prevalent in that amount. Well, especially with these people, these polymorphisms, it's it's really bad off. It can lead to a lot. Of, and I wrote a blog, and I'll put it in the show notes about it. But if you have FU22 polymorphism, it's probably best, unless you have H. pleuri dysbiosis, for you to supplement with 2-FL as a prebiotic to, in the hope to increase your bifidobacterium and improve the positive probiotic microbiome uh, that you may have lacked from having that polymorphism. Yeah, but you might, I mean, you might be secreting something else, you know, so it just depends on the rest of your genetics too. Um, a, a lot of people, I think, they, you know, they, they use those 23andMe calculators and they just like overreact to these things and they don't understand like our system's pretty resilient. So if something is, something gets shut down. Uh, There's usually, something usually to make yeah. its place unless you're dealing with some sort of uh, amino acid metabolism disorder from birth. Most of, most of those are fatal. Or mitochondrial right. uh, inborn diseases, most of those are fatal. There's no redundant system for that. But for like for catch-all methyltransferase, for example, polymorphisms, there are uh, other symptoms to reduce adrenaline or dopamine. Because if there wasn't, then everybody walking around with a COMT polymorphism, you know, you wouldn't have lived past being at birth because you'd have too much adrenaline circling through you, and would never be able to break down properly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I guess we'll probably wrap it up there. Um, and I think we've covered a lot and probably uh, way more than people even want to know about. So uh, there's our there's our uh, prebiotic podcast. Well, hope you all take care and uh, we will talk to you again soon. Bye.